What up, what up, what up, everybody? It's your boy, Neil, and I'm back with another live stream interviewing another Law of Attraction enthusiast. Forgive me, I have a cough drop in my mouth. I be coughing a little bit as of, uh, you know, the past couple of seconds. But uh, we are going to be talking about expansion, specifically your mind, your growth, because then that will trickle out into the physical, your body and the world around you. And I have with me a law of attraction enthusiast, Karen Jawin, who is the expansion life coach. Karen, how are you doing today? Dude, I'm doing incredible, man. Thanks so much for having me out here. Expansion. When I hear that, I am like, that's that's it. That's it. I'm constantly expanding my mind by inserting knowledge into it. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm constantly trying to expand the world by widening the range of the minds of the people in it. So I love that. When you come up with that title, where what did it when you came up with it, what was the the inspiration that gave you that name? The inspiration was what is the opposite of expansion? Contraction. Contraction. Stagnation. Feeling stuck. Feeling like you're trapped. The opposite of that is abundance, opportunity, law of attraction, expansion. What else? What else might there be out there for me? And I think typically stagnation allows people to feel boxed into a certain thing. Like you ever, uh, you ever have someone come up to you and be like, "Oh, you're you're a dentist, therefore you're only a dentist," as if yeah. you're in that thing now for the next six decades, and that's it. How yeah. limiting is that? <laughs> so expansion to me means expanding your mind, your body, your finances, your health your wealth, your relationships, the greatest discovery you can go on is discover who it is you truly are and why are you the way you are. So to me, the word expansion really summarizes all that. And I call my events the expansion project because you are the greatest project. There's no, there's no greater project you're ever going to embark on than building you. Nice. We're going to get into the expansion project and exactly what that is. But I wanted to go back to the law of attraction. When did you learn about it? How did you learn? When was it? real to you and how are you using it in your day-to-day now to keep your life on track i heard about the law of attraction from somebody you who you definitely know bob proctor rest in peace yes. legend yes. in the space you know wrote so many books uh has so many programs thinking into results was when i first heard of the the law of attraction and then i read the secret then i watched the movie the secret and i mm-hmm. found the biggest takeaway for me neo was that i was spending just as much time thinking on what i didn't want as I did thinking on what I did want. And the law of attraction 101 is do not think about what you don't want because that also welcomes it into your presence. So for me, I mean, yeah, thoughts become food, right? So most people think about how they don't want their body to look, how they don't want their bank account to look, how they don't want their Monday morning to look. And when you, although it's a positive statement, it's got a lot of negativity associated with it. So for me, when it became real was, truthfully, this is going to sound like random AF, but somebody once told me your yearly income can become your monthly income. And I said, no way. And then two months later, I landed a contract that was more than double my previous year's yearly income. And it shattered my entire belief system as to what is possible. How long ago was that? A year and a half, two years ago, max, max two years ago. So you've been flying high ever since using the different techniques, you know, to get everything you want. Different techniques. Now I'm all about how can I jump levels, right? You think about linear life, level one, level two, level three, level four, like a video game. But mm-hmm. what if you could just go from level one to level 10 without having to go through steps two, three, four, five, and six, seven, eight, and nine, ah, right? You can, smart you can, man. Bro, you can jump levels in your relationships. You can jump levels in your finances. If you're consistently making, let's say, five to 10K a month, you can easily make 20K a month without having to make 11K, 12K, 13K, and step by step. And I think the only limitation truly is what's on your t shirt. Thoughts become things. You think you can't do it. You think you can't replicate someone else's success. I mean, how many stories do we hear of people in their 50s, 60s, 70s, like the guy who invented KFC, you know, he's like 65, <laughs> Colonel Sanders, right? And then, so I just think that people correlate time and money. Like I can only make X amount of money when I'm a certain age, as if you have to go through the ranks. And it's just not true. Time and money are not and have never been correlated. 
Now, you you stir up something in me. I want to know that if there's any negative narratives that were instilled in you at a young age that you found that you had to get over, and how did you get over them? So many. Number one, money is bad, or money is yeah. scarce. The that root of all evil. <laughs> to me, it was money. Money is scarce. When you get it, you make it. You hold on to it. Put that sucker in your bank account. Do not touch it. Yeah, do not yeah. spend it. Save it for a rainy day. What the heck is a rainy day? Right? Like it rains here four times a week. Do I go spend my money because it's a rainy day? No. <laughs> yeah, I don't. Right. right. So I think one of them was one of them was uh, this like whole concept of like what truly is money. And now I believe money is energy. Money is focus. Money is. <laughs> That's my dog. Money is energy. Money is intention. And now, now I see money as more of a tool to get more of what I want. If it can buy me back time, if it can buy me experiences, if it can buy me moments that I'll never get again, then that's what I use money towards. Number one is money. Another thing that really kept me stuck was this idea that once you pick a career, and I hate that word, but once you pick a career, then you're in that thing for the next four decades. Like how limiting is that? Like you ever imagine you have a grade five student come up to you and he says to you, Neo, I'm a soccer player, but next year I'd love to try basketball. And you say to him, well, you're, you're a soccer player. You can't try basketball. So you already committed to soccer for one year. Now you must commit to soccer for your entire life. How limiting would that be for a child to never be able to go experience a different sport? And I think as adults, as we've become professionals, we are just now boxed into a sport, which is our career, that maybe no longer serves us. Maybe we want, we want to go explore what the basketball version is or the swimming version or the yoga version. But again, we let our environment be play such major influences on us that we feel boxed in and then we feel like a fool when we don't go against the norm. Nice. I always say you got to protect yourself from threats, both foreign and domestic. You know, mm -hmm. those narratives are coming from all kinds of places. Uh, I was talking yesterday on a podcast about one of my teachers who... Uh, her voice changed in my head. It was her voice saying I was never going to amount to nothing. And somehow over the years, that voice changed mm. to my voice. So not only was I hearing it from her, but I was confirming it from myself because of her. And it was that narrative that I needed to shake out of my mind. And I did. I shook it out a long time ago because I realized she was batshit crazy. <laughs> well, you know, here, here's another powerful thing about narratives is you have a narrative. You tell yourself a story, something that's true or untrue about yourself. It doesn't matter. The fact that you're thinking it to, to, a, to a point is true for you. The problem becomes is then when your environment begins to validate your narrative. Right. So let's say you've always been a certain person, yet you want to grow. But then your friend circle or your colleagues or your environment, your parents, your brothers, your siblings, your partner confirm and validate your identity, then truly you feel boxed into that narrative. So how do you actually begin to create a narrative if your environment is not set up to fuel you to think differently about what's possible? And I see a lot of that as being one of the major downsides is people's in, in environment breeds comfortability. It's very comfortable not to make a change. It's very scary to make a change, perceived scariness. So I don't think it's I don't think it's actually risk that people are are are, are actually afraid of. I think if, if you could if one could minimize their risk, risk mitigation, I think people would do so much more. Yeah, it's that fear factor. Um are you speaking at Vanessa's event? No. Um yeah, I think you guys probably just met in a couple of weeks ago in Nashville. Shout out to the Dental Festival and Elijah, uh, mm -hmm. Elijah Desmond. <clears throat> Vanessa's having an event tomorrow. It's gonna be amazing. I'll shoot you the information. But no. It's funny where I'm from, the city I'm from, Camden, New Jersey, shout out to Camden. Um, I can't get people to leave that town. Even if it's to go two towns over to go shopping real quick, I can't get them to leave. And and they feel stuck and they manifest being stuck. Now me being born and raised in that town, there was a certain feeling of stuckness around me that I'm so glad that my father was the one who was like, no, I want bigger, I want better. He grew up in Camden his whole life and went to college in Florida. He had to get out, so he went. And so, you know, he was, you know, kind of the encouragement behind me dreaming bigger than just that town. Um, I did want to ask you this before we get out of here. Day-to-day -day, law of attraction practice. 
anything you do outside of morning rituals. I always ask people about their morning rituals. Everybody's got pretty much the same ones. You know, they get that clarity. They get that appreciation, some deep breathing, all that good stuff. But that's just the morning and night, the nightly ritual. There is a whole 16 hours in between that <laughs> where your mind is going a mile a minute receiving information, processing it in a certain way. How do you stay on top when you get those bad emails? When you get that bad phone call or that bad reminder, like, ah, I'm still dealing with this. You know, I don't have a meeting for another three weeks, but it's in the back of my mind. How do you deal with those narratives? Polarity, like black, white, yin, yang, good, bad, good, evil. We have a tendency to create a reality in our brains like Neo said this thing to me, therefore it tr triggered me to think about something. And that therefore my, my, my reality is, is I'm either a good person or I'm a bad person. Mm -hmm. We get a bad email. The reality is I'm, I'm a bad person. We get uh, a sale doesn't come through. The reality is I'm a bad entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. Where in fact, there's two parallel realities happening, right? There's the one that's serving you and there's the one that's not serving you. And they're both happening at the same time. But with the law of attraction, you choose where your energy goes. So if there's two realities where in one you're not winning and the other reality you're wondering, hey, what else might life be trying to show me right now? I just tend to focus more on what else might life be trying to show me right now. A mentor of mine uh, gave me this concept and I've heard it in, in different ways, but it's called the garden of secrets. And the garden of secrets means what if, right? The thing that just happened, what if it was really trying to teach you something greater? What if this was the conversation you needed to have that allowed all of the growth to happen? What if you're not a bad person? What if you're just not for everyone? What if that person who sent you a really tough email just lost their dog? There's all of these realities and scenarios and possibilities that very well could be happening. We just don't give them enough credit because we just think <laughs> it revolves around us. Yeah, we're like thinking the worst automatically. I always go back to high school when like, you know, girlfriend calls her boyfriend or the guy calls his girlfriend and she doesn't answer. And then like a half an hour later, he's like, man, did I finally get caught? You know what I mean? Like what happened? And then like, she ends up calling him back. Yeah, I was in the shower and it's like 30 minutes worth of negative ass thoughts. <laughs> mm -hmm. And it was, and that just filters over into everything else. Every missed phone call, every, you know, you took too long to get me back to me on that email. Be mindful of those narratives. Now, I want to ask you a really, 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 really tough question. One of the toughest questions that I get to ask people. Because when you get those thoughts in the afternoon, when you get those emails, or you're just driving down the highway in a good mood, and all of a sudden you run a negative scenario. Ooh, this person was sick, and they are getting old. You know, whatever the scenario may be, it's cool to know how to handle it, which is what you just said. Think about, you know, what's going to happen if you spend time in that headspace. Thoughts become mm -hmm. things. The question is, how do you remember to remember to even wake up? You know, that scenario, sometimes those scenarios are just going. 20 minutes go by and you don't, you don't even realize you were running them. That's the problem. You're on autopilot for 20 dang on minutes. Your brain is going to different subjects to here, there, some good, some bad. How do you wake up? from the negative ones so, to do uh, that next part? Yeah, I love this question. And there's a couple different things. The first would be, I'm very vocal. I, I maybe, maybe what I should say is whenever I feel an emotion, I love, I love not suppressing it, right? Suppressing it is what I used to do. I used to, I used to bottle it up and just, it would yeah. sit for 20 minutes, 20 days, sometimes 20 years, bro. When I was in grade six, someone called me fat. And for 20 years, I didn't learn how to swim because of that one moment in grade six, because that changed my relationship with my body and my self-esteem. Now what I do is I voice it to the people who I consider, who, who, I, who, who matter the most to me, my wife, my friends, my clients. I normalize the conversation that's happening in most people's heads. And it helps me get out of myself and wake up and realize, hey, there's a lot of commonality here. Other people are also experiencing this. I'm not alone. I think the problem with some of these moments that happen to us is we feel like they're only happening to us. And mm -hmm. when we feel like they're only happening to us, we tend to blame ourselves. And I, I'm just, I've, I know how business works. I know how life works. And all of us, no matter what your profession is, no matter what your age is, have a series of five or 10 of the same 
problems or the same negative thoughts that are coming up over and over again. And I think creating a, a community or an environment or a coaching program or an, an event, like at my events, these conversations are normalized. So I think getting out of my own lone wolf head and finding other people, whether it's a tribe or a community and just normalizing this conversation helps me bounce back. You know what I love about that is also the positive reinforcement, you know, and whether it be you six and it was a weight thing or you at this age and it's a job thing. When you hang up that phone from that disappointing phone call, um, yesterday, actually, I had a call <laughs> and it was I thought it was going to go great. I just assumed it was I, it was, you know, based off of uh, our first interaction <laughs> And it just kind of went left. And, you know, when I hung up, you know, <laughs> I told my son what happened. I said, yo, that whole thing just, I don't even understand what happened. It just went left. He's four years old. He didn't know what I was saying. But he goes, Daddy, did you have a good phone call? And I looked at him and I said, you know, I thought about the The end result of the phone call was dope. You know, it was just weird and went left. Um and I said, yeah, I had a good phone call. And he, he, I don't know, he just, he got excited. And there's something I say every day about like waking up and get going. And he just lit up and was celebrating the phone call. And he had me celebrating the positive aspect because it was, the phone call was dope. It ended with me getting some connects to some high places. But I wasn't thinking about that when I hung up. Mm -hmm. He got me to thinking about that. Mm -hmm. And you hang up from a business call and tell your spouse, hey, this guy thinks I'm a douchebag. And she goes, honey, you know, daggone well, you're a good person and you're smart at what you boom, yep, pulling you out. So it's that kind of positive reinforcement that you can get from vocalizing what you're going through and sharing. And you know what? The people around you see that you're sharing and they want to share, too. And all that does is bring people closer together, be it your spouse or your kids or your parents. All it does is bring people closer together unless you're, you know sharing too much <laughs> you know i didn't like it last year at that barbecue now nah, don't go that far i want to talk about the 90 day uh what's it called the 90 day letter yeah can you get into that real quick give us a quick rundown on that yeah man i think we underestimate what we can do in a year and we overestimate what we can do in a month so we have these big goals these big dreams these big visions and we think there's no way that could be me again thoughts become things 90 days, three months out, very tangible date into the future, right? Go to Google, go today plus 90 days, and you'll already have a date. And what I like to do with the, with the 90 day letter is I, I imagine what does future Curran want? How does future Curran want to show up in the world? What kind of relationships does future Curran want? What does future Curran want his bank account to look like? What does future Curran want his health to look like, his wealth, his relationships? What does future Curran want his personal growth to look like? And until you associate with a version of yourself that you are super inspired by, then you're just going to base every single day based on your current situation. And everybody has this ideal future version of themselves that they're measuring themselves against, or they're measuring themselves against the lack of where they are versus where they ought to be. What a 90 day letter does is you write a letter to your future self 90 days out that starts with your name, dear Curran, dear Neo. And you pick categories, in my opinion, three to five that you really want to focus on and improve over the next 90 days. Typically, they're relationships, career or money, mm -hmm. health, personal development, and maybe hobbies. Maybe those are the five main categories. And you say, you, you actually write down as if it's already happened, which is, again, law of attraction. Assume it's already happened. And you, you, you write down what, what life will look like 90 days from today. So what the first time I ever did this letter, I think the first sentence was, Dear Curran, can you believe it? You actually quit your nine to five job. And that came true, right? And 90 days later, I had I had quit my nine to five job. So it it gives you tangibility as to the things you say you really want. And it helps you match your intentions with your actions in a 90 day short sprint where in fact, whatever you write down could come true. And in those 90 days, you write the letter, you seal it up in an envelope, you write today's date, you write 90 days from today, so open date, then you, you hide that letter. You either hide it somewhere you can't see it, or you hide it somewhere where you see it every day. Hide it in plain sight. <laughs> hide it in plain sight. 
right? So you see it every day. So you can think as you're writing and you look next to your, your computer desk, you see this 90 day letter, you know, you're going to open it day by day. You're going to get closer to the date of the open date. And subconsciously your intentions and your actions will be aligned to manifest whatever you wrote down. And I've mailed thousands of these letters after my events or after my coaching programs to people all over the world. It's their handwriting. It's their, you know, they lick the, the envelope and stamp it. It's, it's their product. Their DNA is on it. <laughs> it's their DNA. And then they get this letter in the mail 90 days out. And typically one of two things happens, Neil. One, they open the letter and they call me, they message me with excitement saying, holy crap, I can't believe all of this stuff came true or some of this stuff came true. Or 90 days later, I get a note or an email or a video saying, Curran, none of this came true, man. None of this came true. And the only difference between those two different variations of notes that I get or emails that I get is one person really intentionally chose to take action every day towards what they wanted. And the other person, things just got in their way. Their calendars start to fill up. They allowed things they allowed, to get in their way. They allowed time to creep in. They allowed other priorities to get in the in the way. They allowed themselves. Because, uh, dude, I'm real big on accountability. Bro, you know, so, right? if, if you don't do no mental exercises for the next three days because you're extremely busy, that's your fault. Yeah. Don't blame the universe for the amount of emails or tasks that you had assigned to you this week. In between every single email now, I'm really disciplined with it. Every email, every live stream, like as soon as I'm done this live stream, I'm going to go watch an episode of X-Men with my son. I'm going to come back and answer an email. Then I'm going to go outside, stare at the trees for a couple minutes. Come back and do a podcast, take the golf crowd around the block until I'm too hot to keep riding because it's in Florida <laughs> during yeah. the daytime. And that's it. I, 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 I'm not going to say I need them because I didn't do this you know, for most of my life, but it feels good. Separate and multitasking. I learned recently that humans can't multitask. You're just jumping from task to task. In the spirit of that, I know it's necessary sometimes. Just give 100% of your attention to your task at hand mm -hmm. and you will come out feeling better because you put your all into it. And I guarantee that product, that phone call, that email will come out better than it could have come out had you not been giving it that attention. So make sure you put that focus into that. I love the letter. I can't wait to start on it. It's funny because me and you talked about it uh, not too long ago, but I didn't get that. I didn't get all that. Let me go back and look at my notes from our conversation. I'm ready for this. I'm going to put it right, right between these two, uh, right between these two computer screens. Game changing exercise, man. Game changing things. Like I, I love recommending tools or tips or exercises that anybody can implement. If you have a sheet of paper in front of you and you have a pen and you can write down, what do you want your life to look like 90 days from now? How do you want to feel physically? What do you want your relationship at home to look like? What do you want love and abundance to look like in your life? Whatever that is for you, write it down on a sheet of paper, put it in an envelope, seal it up, put a reminder on your phone, say, hey, Google, remind me 90 days to open up this letter and you're done. And then subconsciously start taking action towards the things that you wrote down that you say you wanted. Is there, is there, I have to ask, is there some kind of rem reminder somewhere of all five, just in case you forget, you forget one for the whole 90 days. You're like, man, I totally forgot about, I was supposed to be working on my health. I haven't worked out in three months. Well, that's why I would say the thing that goes in the letter should and must really matter to you. Okay. Right. And don't overcomplicate it. If you want five categories in your life that you want to improve, just pick two for the first 90 day letter, right? Don't be overwhelmed. Don't, don't get to the 90 days and be like, oh, well, there's five was too many categories current. I failed because you told me to do five and I didn't have enough time. Okay. So pick the two of your life, health, wealth, finances, career, love, personal development, hobbies, pick the two where you feel like you want to improve the most and just write your 90 day letter about those two things. Let's say you just wanted to improve your finances and you just wanted to improve your relationship at home. Just those two things. Then write as if you have a completely different view with money, relationship with money. Maybe your career looks different 90 days out. Maybe your relationship looks totally different in 90 days from now. And it can right? But you have to want it. It's not about even the word like categories, like you, you pick, 
right? Maybe you want to have a better relationship with your dog. Cool. Put it in the letter. <laughs> Maybe you want to cut back on dessert. Cool. Put it in the letter, right? What there's no, it's, it's beautiful. This is like a grade one project. It's impossible yeah. to fail. It's like, what is it you want? <laughs> what did you, what would you want? And if you had it, what would you be saying? Mm. I'm so happy this happened already. Um, all right. Now I'm going to become a student real quick here. Um, three rapid fire questions, typing versus writing. I know writing is obviously more powerful, but is typing not advised for this? For the letter, 100% yes. it should be written. Pen, okay. paper, brain, neuroscience connection, 100%. All right, next, next question. Why 90 and not 60 days? 90 I found, days. That, I found that most people can manifest pretty decent in 30 days. So... That's 90 why. days for me gives you four opportunities in a calendar year to really go after what you believe in. Four quarters. Broken up, the year broken up into four, four quarters, 90 mm -hmm. days. 12 weeks, not a lot of time. And I know some people say it takes 90 days to build a habit. Some people say it takes 21 days. Some mm -hmm. of the studies actually say it takes 66 days. But is a habit yeah. truly a habit if you break it? It's I know a couple of crackheads that say it'd take one day. <laughs> hey man, shout out to Camden. No. <laughs> shout out to Camden. Yeah, okay, okay. Right. So for me, ninety days is a is a twelve week. It's a quarter. It's a quarter of your life. It's a quarter of your business. It's a quarter of your calendar year. It's it's doable. Sixty days. Sometimes again, most people overestimate what they can do even in a month. Right? They yeah. say, okay, well, I'm at zero income right now. In a month's time, I'll be at twenty k a month. I'm like that's a big jump. It's doable, but it's a big jump. But what if in the first month you got your income from zero to five, and the next month you got your income from five to ten or five to fifteen, and then the next month you got multiply, you got, and you just got up to by twenty, right? So whether you hit your 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 result ninety days from now or sixty days from now, either way, you're gonna fall in a greater position than as if you've never started in the first place. So nice. if 90 days, I mean, if you can try 90 days, if it doesn't work for you, hey, go do a 60 day letter because what works for me may not work for you. And again, because there's no right or wrong way to do this, you could do a 60 day letter. You could do a 90 day letter. You could do a six month letter if that's mm -hmm. what you want to commit to. Again, this is about you. Just don't do a five year letter. It's just, you take too long. Yeah. <laughs> you know, most people no, I would do have for lunch next week. It's funny. I, I I used to have this thing. Oh man, I forget what I called it. It's been so long since I thought about this, but I imagine that myself five years from now or five months from now, like kind of like emailed or sent myself a letter with a picture mm. and the picture was convincing. I was older. All of my family members were older, but I was in a mansion. And, and everything around me was dead. Like I can see the, I can visualize it. Like I'm there now. It's so vivid. And uh, I got to bring that exercise back. But yeah, it was a letter to me from that version of me saying, you know, basically, hey, listen, five months, that's it. I know you've been waiting a long time. Another five months. And then it, when, it, when I thought about it, of course, I didn't have a picture and I didn't even have the letter. This was all just going on in my mind, but I was able to sit in it. If I'd have normally ran a scenario like that, my ego would have said, no, you're not. No, you're not. What are the chances of you? Da, 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 da. How many people that you know have da, da, da. No, I was able to sit in it and marinate like, yes. All right. And I had the weight was lifted off my chest. All right. There's nothing else I got to do extra. Just keep doing what I'm doing. And it's just, you know, keep, you know. And so that was a beautiful thing. And I, I love that. Uh, you actually answered all three of my questions with your answer. So I'm just going to move on to the next question real quick, which is nightly rituals. Uh, I wanted to tie this in with meetings because I believe that you do something before meetings that I do before bed about meetings, you know? So what is it you do before a meeting to not hype yourself up, but law of attraction related before a meeting? So, I mean, I, I think I know the thing you're talking about or, or I could be totally off, but I always, 
I mean, on my Zoom calls, on my Zoom meetings, when before someone comes in and, and meets with me, there's this really beautiful welcome message waiting for them. It says, hey, take a moment, be super grateful for everything you have in your life. I might be busy with a client right now. I might be grabbing a tea or a water or just preparing for this meeting. Take a moment, take a couple of breaths and just be extremely grateful for all that you have. Is that what you're referring to? No, you said something, but I actually wrote it down. Uh, you said 15 minute meditation before a meeting oh. um, to the point where you can almost you see and it's so you're seeing it so vividly that you can almost uh touch it and you ask yourself what's the next best thing i could do to get there mm. okay so that's not necessarily i do that before a meeting that is a daily ritual so oftentimes i mean you've heard about morning routines you've heard about meditation visualization for me again i don't visualize something that's five years away because it's it's so it's so far into the future that i actually begin to lose Sight yeah. of it. I, I begin to lose touch of it. So when I wake up in the morning or at some point throughout the day, as part of my routine, I meditate for 15 minutes. The first five minutes, I just sit still on my couch and I use an app called Insight Timer, which has this nice, like, uh, beautiful symbolic bell. It's like, it's like a nice, you know, like the, the people that have sound baths and they hit the thing. It's like, dong. Mm, it's like a yeah. really beautiful noise. Yeah. So every five minutes, this bell makes a, a, a ding noise, but in a super beautiful therapeutic way, the first five minutes, I just sit in silence and I just connect with, with my breath. The next five minutes, I begin to appreciate all that I have in my life, my clients, my relationship, my family, my health, my friends. I just, I just sit in a moment of five minutes and just really appreciating, oh man, I met Neo last week. He's a crazy crazy dude who's just doing a hundred things at once. Man, that guy's energy, that guy's smile is crazy. And I'm so glad I went to the dental festival. I met so many people. I'm just sitting in so much gratitude for five minutes. And then I think about a moment in the future. It could be tonight. It could be tomorrow. It could be six months from now. I think about a moment in the future. Where am I? Who am I with? Who am I helping? Where, what, where am I? And I just think about that. And I try to get as crystal clear as possible on what that vision is. And upon waking up after that 15-minute meditation cycle, I ask myself, based on everything I just did in the last 15 minutes, what is the best next thing that I could go do right now that could get me closer to that vision? Sometimes the best next thing is Neil popped up in my meditation for some reason. I'm just going to send Neil a quick message and say, what's up? Cause I haven't talked to him in a while. Yeah. Oftentimes I think about a client or a prospect who I really want to work with and I'll message him and say, Hey, I just came out of a meditation. You know, you, you really came up for me. What's going on with your business these days? Other times it's like I connect with somebody who I've been meaning to connect with, but I haven't sent that first message and it just triggers me to send the first message. Sometimes the, the best next thing could be go look at all the money you've made this year and be grateful. <laughs> yeah. Manifest more grateful about money situations. <laughs> right? Yeah, because we're always measuring ourselves, my friend, against what we don't have. It's like, well, we don't have the perfect house. We don't have the perfect relationship. We wish our bank account looked different. We wish our career, we wish we didn't hate Mondays, right? When, when people say they hate Mondays, oh, I could talk about that for six hours, <laughs> uh, just, as, just as you could, right? We, we often, we think about the gap of where we ought to be and we fail to acknowledge how far you've come. Like if I was to say, Neo, if I was to tell you the date, August 4th, 2012, you could probably think to some degree where you were, what you were doing, but I'm, I'm almost willing to put my life savings that that was 10 years ago, 10 years ago, August 4th, 2012. I don't think you could have predicted where you are today or who you are as a person or all that you have in your life. That was 10 years ago. So yeah, if you can just think back at where you were 10 years ago and how little you knew about the, about life and the world, and you just look at how far you've come in 10 years, just 10 years, and then I say the dates, August 4th, 2032, which is 10 years into the future, right? We already talked about it 10 years in the past. Now we just take that same energy and say, wow, can you imagine what life is going to look like in 2032? And I realize there's so much you can't touch. You can't touch. Like you're so disconnected from it. But the way to get too connected to that future self is look at where you were 10 years ago. It's mind blowing. When I think back to where I was in 2012, 10 years ago, lived in a different city, different relationship, different career. Everything was different. Everything was different. 
And never in my wildest journal entries would I have ever predicted that this would be my life today, 10 years ago. It's not possible. It's just, I can't even fathom. So when I think about just abundance and opportunity, and anytime you you feel like this lack moment of like, oh, I, I wish I had more, just look at how far you've already come. That's a huge, uh, that's huge, a huge thing of mine. I never looked at it like that, but I have an impressive background. So when I'm feeling, when I'm not feeling the love, you know, and you just got some days, it's just, you're just trying to feel it and you can't for whatever reason, mm -hmm. I might be hung over. I don't know, whatever the reason is, uh, I just go over, you know, the whole cop in the number one most dangerous city in america dot 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 and let me tell you something i never thought i was going to be a pilot i never thought i was going to be a pilot let alone fly as much as i do mm -hmm. that is insane i thought i thought that was ruled out of my life as soon as i needed glasses as soon as i found that i wasn't 2020 vision the because because they said you had to have 2020 to be a pilot back back in the you know in the 80s uh i just ruled it out for the rest of life and now I fly as many days a week as the weather allows me. And it's just, and everything else, not to mention everything else, you know, retirement, kids and living in Florida, none of that. Um, yeah. So yeah, totally agree with it. And I'm thankful since I've been wielding the law of attraction proactively, as opposed to just thinking randomly. Um, it's been a great journey. Mm -hmm. It's been a hell of a journey. The things I've learned, the people I've met, it's just been a crazy journey, but it's just, that journey is just getting started. I'm 41 well, I years old. Life. I got some time left. I got mad time left. I'm, I'm going to take advantage of it. I don't know if we have time for me to share a quick story, do we? Yeah, come on. We passed our seven-minute limit a long time. 30, 30 <laughs> minutes ago. We, we, we come on. <laughs> so this, this story is really about asking yourself, like, who's, who's driving your own car? Like, who's, who's driving your life? And it's a story about the Pope. And the Pope got this email. I know Pope uses emails these days. So the, the Pope got this email saying, hey, we're, we're inviting you to, to America to come speak at this, at this conference. The Pope was super excited. He's always wanted to visit America. And the reason he really wanted to come to America was all he could see was this freeway. He saw himself driving a stretch limo down the freeway, going 250, arm out the window. He just wanted to live that American dream. That was his version of the American dream on the highway just top down, living it up. So he accepts. He gets to the airport in the US. Sure enough, a stretch limo driver come picks him up. And the Pope says to the driver, hey, this might sound really odd, but can I drive? And of course, the chauffeur was like, you're the Pope. You can do whatever you want. Sure. So he lets the Pope drive and he gets in the back seat. Sure enough, Pope finds the highway, uses the, the GPS system. Now the Pope's driving. There's this new police officer just starting this week. So the Pope's going 250. The police officer uses his radar gun stops the car pull it turns on the lights the pope looks back Hold on. what's 250 250 miles an hour in a stretch limousine yeah it's the pope man the pope can do whatever he wants let's so do it flying, and th this police car turns on the sirens the pope sees the sirens obviously knows the rules so he pulls over now this new police officer comes up to the front window and he realizes who he's talking to so he's like sir hold on one moment goes back to the car. You probably know this lingo better than I do. He goes back to the car, checks in with his captain, says, Captain, you're never going to believe who I pulled over. Captain was like, who is it? Is it that? Is it the, the missing man for the last six months? The guy says, no, Captain. This guy's even bigger. He's like, okay, tell me who you pulled over. Did you pull over Tom Cruise, Brad Pitt? Like, tell me who you got. It's like, no, Captain. This person is even bigger. The captain finally freaks out. and It's like, okay, who is it? Is it, is it the president of the, of the United States? And the guy's like, no, Captain, even bigger. This person's even bigger. The captain was like, all right, dude, just tell me who did you pull over? The, the, the young police officer says, I don't know who it is, Captain, but whoever he is, he's got the Pope as his driver. <laughs> that's good the stuff. Moral, the, moral that of the, story, is good stuff. the moral of the story is sometimes we just don't know who's driving our car, man. Is, you know, we wake up and we're angry and we don't know why. We wake up, we go to a job. We don't know why. We don't know why we love it. We wake up in a relationship sometimes that's not serving us and somebody else is driving all parts of our life except for you. You're not even the driver of your own seat. And I talk to a lot of people who are in 
not so healthy relationships where they're not in control. They're not driving. I talk to people who are in unhappy careers. Again, they're not driving. I talk to people who, who consistently want a different reality. And when, I, when we get to the crux of it, we realize they're not driving their own car, man. So how can you start to take control? How do you, how do you actually claim ownership of your vehicle? You know what I'm going to say? Two drivers. Two drivers. Because most people, or some people, I'll say, aren't driving their own car. Mm -hmm. And then they're listening to someone else's directions in life, be it their spouse, mm -hmm. their boss, their kids are telling them what to do, their neighbors are telling them what to do, city hall laws are telling them what to do. You've got all these drivers trying to drive a car that you're the only one that knows how many car carburetors it has. Because yep. I know most, most cars only have one carburetor. But since we are all different inside, there's all kind of different stuff going on up here. We all got different experiences. So not only do you got yourself not driving your car, it's being influenced by all these other things. So to step out and take the mm -hmm. steering wheel from everyone is, I believe, the equivalent of being awake being aware of what's going on as opposed to letting your autopiloted, you know, 80, 90% of your 60 to 70,000 thoughts on average per day per person, taking the wheel on those. Mm -hmm. That is the root of every mental exercise I have. Got a newsletter that goes out. By the way, I didn't even post about that and I'm gonna do it right now. My son is like, daddy, get your ass in here. <laughs> I'm gonna put it up here right now. Every mental exercise that I've come up with over the years starts off with waking up. You got to wake up first. And waking up at first is difficult, but the more you practice it, the better you get at it. The more your brain will wake up on its own. Mm -hmm. So practice it and get better at waking up. And when you wake up, do something with it. Affirmation, visualization, technique, whatever you're going to do, mm -hmm. get right and do it. Mm -hmm. All right. So my favorite number is 42. My son's on the other side of the door. I don't know what he's calling me for, but we're going to get out of here. Got anything you want to leave us with before we end this live stream, brother? No, man. Just if, if people found it valuable, you know, we, we live in a world where everyone is so connected to one another. Send me a message and say, Kern, hey, this thing really resonated with me or this thing definitely did not resonate with me. And if you like the word expansion, I mean, I would invite you to come check out one of our expansion events that happen every four months. And my website, Neo, graciously shared below, Um, I'm always looking for really cool people that are looking to get back in control of their driver's seat. Boom. I went to an event. You know, I met Kern at Nashville. Uh, Dentistry's got talent. I went on, yeah, I went on stage and I was like, I saw the judge. I said, who is this other judge? I've never seen this guy before. Um, but he flexed like me. You know, uh, when I first went to the dental festival, I made a big splash. Everybody knew who I was by the end of day one. And was, everybody was talking about me by, you know, the beginning of day two. And Kern came in and did the same thing uh, and, uh, in Nashville. And so I, you know, I immediately identified with that. And we gelled on the law of attraction on a, on a major level. So we're going to have some more stuff coming for you guys, some more collaborations in the future. So this is not the last you see of this man. Take his words, take his words, get with him, support him on social media. That way he can continue to do what he's doing. Mm -hmm. Kern, I want to thank you for being a soldier in the war on negativity. We need more people like us out there spreading the word, getting the law of attraction out there. Like I said to you on the phone the other day, I don't know who you know or what all you got your hands in. But if you love the law of attraction and you want it to spread sooner than later, what can you do today to make it spread sooner than later? And that's what we need to ask ourselves every day. Whatever it is, do that. Post, talk about it, be about it, and make sure you guys are ready for August 20th. Neo Positivity's Thoughts Become Things Summit from noon to 4 p.m. Eastern time. I will see you guys there. Once again, thank you to the fans. Thank you from everybody for chiming in, for listening. And thank you, Curry and Curran, for coming on here and blessing us with all your information. I love you guys. I'll catch you on the next one. Peace. <laughs>